Testing one, two, three. 
All right, we're going to begin here in just a moment. Can we, can we make it louder or adjust the volume up? Test, 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 test. Yeah, a little louder or, yeah. All right. If we can begin taking our seats. There are, there are some seats up front. Just uh, two brief announcements before we begin uh, this evening's talk. Uh, for those of you who are participating in the conference, uh, some of you weren't, there, there were a number of students who weren't here this afternoon, and so we, we rearranged the groups, and we made three groups into two. Um, I'm not sure if that will be wise tomorrow. They were somewhat large, so there's another bug it looks like students are looking at. This happened to me in class the other day. Wasps are the, uh, the enemy of attention in class. Um, but if we can, tomorrow we're supposed to start at 9.30, uh, our first seminar. If everybody would just meet in here around by 9.25 so that I can get a, a sort of recount of everyone here so that we can decide whether or not we want to keep the two groups or divide into three in the morning. So 9.25 rather than 9.30, and we'll, we'll, we'll meet and, and send everyone off. Um, dinner tonight, again, for students, um, and that is, doesn't just need to be students who are doing the full conference, because I ordered a lot of pizza. Um, there will be pizza coming next door to uh, Holy Grounds. It will be delivered there. Um, lots of uh, veggie and cheese pizza for Lent. Um, so please go over there. The drinks uh, will be there, and some other sides as well. Um, for faculty... Uh, for faculty and guests who would like to join us for dinner this evening, we will be going off campus, and I'm giving you the name of the restaurant now. Uh, the name of the restaurant, uh, you can see me after as well, but it's Terra Mia's. Uh, so all faculty are invited, um, and our guests, Terra Mia's in McAdenville. Terra Mia's in McAdenville. So we will, after the question and answer period, head over there. Okay? Any logistics questions before we begin? Great. Well, welcome everyone uh, to our Jack Miller Conference. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, well, welcome everyone to our Jack Miller Conference um, on Tocqueville's other book. That was my title that I decided to give it. Tocqueville's other book, uh, L'Ancien Régime et la Révolution. Um, we are delighted to come together uh, to discuss this work. Uh, uh, we began this afternoon, and we'll continue with our three seminars tomorrow. We're especially thankful for our keynote speaker here, Dr. Daniel Mahoney, who I'll introduce uh, in more depth in just a minute. Uh, before I begin, I just want to make a few thank yous before I forget. The first thank you, of course, is to the Jack Miller Center. Uh, 
um, who has been generous to, uh, to us uh, over the last few years. Um, they funded a conference for us last year, and they funded this conference as well and our Constitution Days. Without them, uh, the hotel rooms, the travel, the meals, and Dr. Mahoney being here would be impossible. So first, I just want to very seriously thank them. In addition, I really think it's important to thank, um, in a non-pandering way, uh, our faculty and our students, because this is a very busy time in the semester. This really is a very busy time in the semester. We're about to hit Easter. Uh, there are exams and papers due. And so to come here, uh, those who have traveled from Tennessee, but, but even our Abbey faculty and students, to read 120 extra pages uh, in the middle of a semester because it's worth doing is something really that ought to be, um, ought to be praised. So thank you very much. Um, you being here matters. It, it, it means something to us. Um, thanks also to Chartwells, who uh, will be providing food for us tomorrow. Uh, thank you to Rolando and Diana, who are from our marketing team, who have arranged the live streaming for us tonight. Um, it's always uh, complicated getting all the audio and the video working just right, so thank you very much uh, to you. So before I introduce Dr. Mahoney, I just want to offer a, a brief, a very brief justification for why we continue to do this. Um, we take this time in the middle of busy semesters to come together to read and discuss these works, especially works like uh, this other book by Alexi de Tocqueville. And I think for me, and I won't necessarily ascribe this to anyone else, the reasons for that can be found in uh, some really beautiful passages in Tocqueville. I knew Dr. Mahoney was the right person to have here for this lecture, um, because when I asked him to do it in an email, he said, I would love to come and talk about the beautiful, the beautiful um, work, the ancient regime. Right? My wife for years has been telling me that Euclid is beautiful, and I, I um, haven't been able to get that yet, but, right, but, but there's, right, there's something there. And when somebody else can see that beauty, you know that, that they're the person for you. And so for, for me, Tocqueville is, is not only um, enlightening, but also writes in a very beautiful way. And in these two passages, I think, express why we continue to do this every year in the midst of our academic life. Tocqueville says at the very end of Democracy in America, the following. I am not unaware that several of my contemporaries have thought that peoples are never masters of themselves here below and that they necessarily obey, I do not know which insurmountable and unintelligible force born out of previous events, the race, the soil, or the climate. Those are false and cowardly doctrines that can never produce any but weak men and pusillanimous nations. Providence has not created the human race either entirely independent or perfectly slave. It traces, it is true, a fatal circle around each man that he cannot leave. But within its vast limits, man is powerful and free. So too with peoples. Nations of our day cannot have it that conditions within them are not equal. But it depends on them whether equality leads them to servitude or freedom, to enlightenment or barbarism, to prosperity or misery. And so I think for most of us, this is the open question before us. And all of us, no matter what our vocations are, that may be an active political life, it may be as mothers and fathers, it may be as educators, we think that that question is still open. And so we come together to discuss them. One last indulgent passage, and Dr. Mahoney may be reading this as well. I think many of us share a love of some sort of liberty, whatever that may mean, and, and we'll continue to talk about that this weekend. This passage, um, embarrassingly perhaps, moved me to tears as I taught it last semester, and this is in the ancient regime. He says the following, and I think it's so apropos uh, for our time, the, the, the time we find ourselves. He says, is there a man whose soul is so mean as to wish to depend on the whims of a single member of his community rather than to obey the laws he himself has helped to establish. 
That is, if he thinks his nation exhibits the qualities necessary to make a proper use of liberty. I do not think such a man exists. Even despots accept the excellence of liberty. The simple truth is that they wish to keep it for themselves and promote the idea that no one else is at all worthy of it. Thus, our opinion of liberty does not reveal our differences, but the relative value which we place on our fellow man. And this is, this is the, the line. We can state with conviction, therefore, that a man's support for absolute government is in direct proportion to the contempt he feels for his country. Right? We can state with conviction, therefore, that a man's support for absolute government is in direct proportion to the contempt he feels for his country. I am asking for a little more time before I convert to such an opinion. And I think for all of us, many of us, we come together and saying, May maybe that's where this is all going. But we want a little more time. We want to strive to make the decisions and impact our society and our, our government so that that is not the result. With that, I will introduce our speaker who's going to talk more about this particular beautiful text. Dr. Mahoney serves currently as a, a, a professor emeritus at Assumption College. He received his BA from the College of Holy Cross and his MA and PhD from the Catholic University of America in political science. His uh, publication record is far too long to go into now, both at the academic level and the popular level. But very briefly, a few things. He serves as a senior writer at Law and Liberty, uh, a senior fellow at Real Clear Foundation. That's Real Clear Politics, right? Uh, for those of you who go online. Um, for the 20, uh, 20, this was 21 academic year, he was a Garwood Visiting Fellow in the James Madison Program at Princeton University. Among his many books are, oh boy, Bertrand de Juvenel, The Conservative Liberal and the Illusions of Modernity, The Other Solzhenitsyn, Telling the True About a Misunderstood Writer, The Truth About a Misunderstood Writer and Thinker, and The Idol of Our Age, How the Religion of Humanity Subverts Christianity. His latest book, The Statesman as Thinker, Portraits of Greatness, Courage and Moderation will soon be released by Encounter Books on May 10th, 2022. And so tonight he's going to offer us some uh, observations in general on Tocqueville and on, on the ancient regime. And so he's gonna give a talk entitled Tocqueville and the Spirit of Liberty. If you would all please welcome Dr. Daniel Mahoney. Well, thank you very much for that gracious introduction. And those are, by the way, two wonderful quotations from uh, Tocqueville. The, la the first uh, is from the uh, penultimate, ultimate paragraph of Democracy in America. And it really expresses Tocqueville's view that while human and political agency is circumscribed in the modern age, we don't have the choice of going back to the Med Middle Ages or the ancient city that the choice for liberty and human dignity is still a contested question. In other words, we remain free within that faded circle. And, and, and Tocqueville was very, very interested in getting his fellow conservatives and aristocrats to stop, in a way, uh, being too nostalgic for an antiquated or superannuated political and social order and use their energies and insights and principles to elevate and humanize this emerging new democratic world. Of course, we live at a time when we see, uh, we see that the democratic dispensation is perfectly compatible with an, an, an erosion of public spirit or with a theoretical and practical materialism or even a deep moral nihilism, not to mention a certain amount of ideological fanaticism, or what Edmund Burke called metaphysical madness. So Tocqueville, I think, is a thinker who provides much guidance for maintaining one's sanity within 
the broad structures of the late modern world. And um, he doesn't suffer from any undue nostalgia. He's not, he's not going, he, a Tocqueville inspired scholar or citizen would not succumb to, or Christian would not succumb to integralism or, you know, medieval nostalgia or that kind of thing. I'll quote Nietzsche here. Whisper to the conservatives, only a crab can crawl backwards, right? But on the other hand, Tocqueville never succumbed to what I would call progressivism, the ideology of progress, the illusion that the drama of good and evil. He imagines a social and political estate where human beings are withdrawn from society and active citizenship, where they're caught up in what he calls their uh, petty and paltry pleasures. Look at our phones, you know. And uh, we give up any desire really to govern ourselves. And we are sheep guided over by shepherds, bureaucrats, administrators, you know, who know experts, who know what's good for us. So that's uh, Tocqueville's cauchemar in French, his nightmare. Right, a democracy where people have lost the virility, the self-respect to be free and acting citizens and proud human beings, proud of their dignity, not reducing themselves to a kind of petty satisfaction with, Pascal called it, licking the earth, you know, kind of a, a, a you know, a satisfaction with the lowest aspects of the human soul. So um, Tocqueville's a complicated man and thinker because he at once acknowledges the justice of this new democratic dispensation, but he also uh, was fully aware of the dangers that accompanied the, the modern adventure or the new democratic, social, and political state. Um, and um, he says, for example, in the preface to volume uh, two of his most famous work, his other, other book, Democracy in America, that um, he's obliged to be a friend, but not a flatterer of democracy. Or my late friend, uh, Peter Gustin Lawler from Berry College, great Tocqueville scholar, used to call Tocqueville uh, uh, democracy's best friendly critic, right? But we gotta, we gotta remember the criticism too, the warning against complacency and not simply sort of a self-satisfying view that you know, we're the top of the world and that everything that came before us is somehow unjust or, this is what the late Roger Scruton calls the culture of repudiation just repudiate as elitist and unjust and racist and unbecoming all the wisdom, all the tradition, all the social practices of the past. So Tocqueville's what I would call a conservative liberal or a liberal conservative. He defends the best of modern liberty, but he also nods to what's living and enduring in classical and Christian wisdom. Um, I mentioned that Tocqueville, I think Tocqueville is a very honorable, even noble man. You can't say that about Rousseau. Hobbes is most famous for like living to 98, you know. He really uh, put self-preservation into, uh, you know, he lived during the English Civil Wars and all of this and all this. Uh, Machiavelli is, a, 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 the Florentine is, a, you know, a serious an audacious political thinker, but the word noble doesn't come to mind for any of these men. But nobility comes to mind when we think about, when we read, when we talk about Tocqueville. Um, and I think there's a reason for that. I think he was committed not just to the abstractions of democratic politics, but to preserving human greatness, human excellence, in a democratic age. His best friend, uh, Gustave de Beaumont said, the man exuded nobility. Uh, and uh, to pick up from the opening remarks, I do think L'Ancien Regime et la Révolution uh, 
is his most beautiful or noble book because his love of liberty, a love that is not reducible to doing your own thing or simply having rights to pursue happiness idiosyncratically understood, but liberty as the honorable pursuit of virtue, liberty as the manly exercise, the virile exercise of self-government. Um, that was Tocqueville's, the great desiderata uh, uh, that Tocqueville saw um, confronting uh, human beings who took their humanity seriously. All right. Um, now, I think it's important to know that the ancien regime and the revolution, uh, the, uh, the old regime and the revolution, revolution, and the old regime, by the way, for any of you who are wondering, is simply the whole political, social, cultural, religious order that, uh, a human order that preceded the revolution of 1789. So uh, the French habitually refer to l'ancien regime, the old regime. So it's not a particular political administration or king. It's essentially the French social order from the end of the high middle ages until the outbreak of the first ideological revolution of modern times, the French Revolution of 1789. And Tocqueville, who was born in 1805, uh, lived in a extremely tumultuous time where the French were divided between those who were nostalgic for what had been lost or overthrown as a result of the tempestuous French Revolution. The French Revolution really goes from 1789 until the defeat of Napoleon. Napoleon, the emperor of the French, you know, he crowned himself in front of the Pope in uh, 1805, you know, a very daring, audacious act. He was very much a child of the Revolution. He was not a, a typical emperor. He owed nothing to heredity. Uh, 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 but, but instead, Napoleon wanted to stabilize the French Revolution. And he continued the centralizing tendencies of the, the French monarchy and the French Revolution. And then there's nothing, the Code Napoleon, the, the, the outbreak of a series of European, even world wars, that uh, um, the, the French Revolution took different forms. But the mystery of the French Revolution for Tocqueville I think was linked to the fact that a revolution that began with a kind of noble appeal to les droits de l'homme, the rights of man, to self-government, to human freedom, culminated so quickly, first in blood and despotism, the Jacobin dictatorship of the Committee of Public Safety, Maximilien Robespierre, Maximilien Robespierre gave a series of speeches. You know, he was a, they say he was a man of virtue. He was an ascetic. He didn't believe in any personal pleasure. He didn't drink. He didn't seem to have sex. He just lived for revolutionary purity. But in a series of speeches, famous speeches, uh, Robespierre argued that terror was the great instrument of revolutionary virtue. Montesquieu said the, uh, that honor was, uh, was, a, was the, the principle of French monarchy. Uh, and, uh, but Robespierre said terror, the evisceration of the enemies of the people, was the principle, the spring of action that animated true uh, revolution. And then, of course, Napoleon comes to power in 1799. He's elected in one of those plebiscitary votes. You know, he got like 98.2% of the vote. And, uh, uh, and he establishes a highly concentrated form of personal despotism and centralized power. He was no Hitler or Stalin. He didn't murder a lot of Frenchmen. He killed a lot of Frenchmen because of his foreign adventures. But um, this French Revolution very quickly went from libertarian aspirations to bloody, murderous despotism to a kind of military despotism and imperialism under Napoleon. 
So when Tocqueville set out to write the L'Ancien Régime et la Révolution, his goal, I think, was to make sense of the movement from the old regime to the revolution in this more global sense. And uh, in France, everyone, all the partisans, the partisans of the old regime, the clerical party, the monarchist party, the people nostalgic for the old regime, they all believed there was an absolute chasm between the French old regime and the new revolutionary order. And the revolutionaries, of course, believed that there was an absolute and unbridgeable chasm between the revolution and the Ancien Regime. Tocqueville certainly acknowledged that the revolutionaries aimed at destroying, eviscerating every aspect of the old France and the old Europe. And that meant, you know, we had our revolution in the United States. Uh, the, the founding fathers, you know, certainly at the whether at the Continental Congress in 1776 with the uh, Declaration of Independence and its authorization on July 4th, 1776, or the federal constitution, those founding fathers who met in two hot months in May and June, 1787, nobody declared this is the year zero, you know? No one replaced Anno Domini. We have replaced Anno Domini, by the way. The Christian era, BCE, before the Christian era. And that really, I think, is a galloping sign of our de-Christianization as a people and civilization. We've done in a kind of nicer, gentler way what the French revolutionaries did. We've expunged the centrality of Christ's birth as the central moment in European civilization. But the French really, the French revolutionaries really adopted the attitude that nothing really mattered before 1789. Uh, the Khmer Rouge, the, by the way, we always talk about the Khmer Rouge. They were French, by the way, red used to be the universal color of revolution and communism. Only in America is red the color of the Republican Party. You know, we used to talk about pinkos, you know, they were people who were a little red, a little soft on communism, you know. But now, uh, but anyway, uh, the Khmer Rouge, the Pol Pot, the Cambodian communists who killed a third of the population in Cambodia uh, between 1975 and January 1979, they spoke about the year zero. Everything was starting anew from fresh. And everything associated with the old order. Remember, the Khmer Rouge killed people who wore glasses because that meant they must have read old scriptures and old books and have been deeply formed by attitudes and principles incompatible with the revolution, right? Well, there was some of that, not all, not all the original French revolutionaries, but certainly the most radical factions were committed to the extirpation of the pre-revolutionary world. And that ambition was very deep and abiding. So Tocqueville's book, The Ancien Regime and the Revolution, is in many ways an effort to say to both sets of partisans, while the revolution certainly and it's inspired to a radical and absolute break with the old order, it didn't really succeed. Many of the habits, many of the traits, many of the institutional behaviors that characterize a, a centralizing uh, uh, political order under the old French monarchy. I'm, talking, I'm not talking about the Middle Ages where aristocrats had some political authority, where there was vigorous town government in the cities. Louis XIV and others had more or less taken that away. I mentioned to the group I was ta talking about the book with uh, in the first session that, you know, the Estates General, the French parliament, the meeting of the three great estates, the clergy, the nobility, and the commoners, it hadn't met since 1614. As I said, can you imagine the king invokes the estates general to come together in 1788. And that's when, you know, the, the estates meet and the third estate declares itself an Assemblée Nationale and declares France to be a democracy where the vote is not by a state, but by all the representatives of the people. That's the beginning. 
and things almost immediately get very, very bloody, right? So Tocqueville looks at all of this and he sees that the French really do not understand themselves because all the partisans on the left, on the right, the partisans of the old regime, the supporters of the revolution, all believe that there is an absolute in ineradicable gap, chasm, as I said before, between the old regime and the revolution. And Tocqueville says it's much more complicated. There are layers and levels of complicity and continuity that most everyone ignore or neglect. Now, just to make clear, Tocqueville certainly believed that the French Revolution, the French, various French revolutionary regimes were more despotic, less liberal, less respectful of elementary human freedoms than even the old regime. One of the paradoxes is even though Parliament hadn't met for 175 years, Tocqueville does not see the French old regime as essentially being a despotism. There was a spirit of liberty that was very pronounced and that still animated many of the French, especially the French aristocrats, despite their concomitant absence of vigorous uh, political responsibilities as the aristocratic class had in England. But the French Revolution further centralized power, further eroded political freedom. It introduced what the Israeli historian J.L. Talman called uh, totalitarian democracy. It was a revolution fought in the name of the people, a popular sovereignty, and yet it established forms of despotic control and coercion that were really unseen in Europe in the 2,500 years of the European adventure. So that's not to say the revolution and the old regime are the same, but it is to say that the bureaucratic and administrative and centralizing propensities of uh, the, uh, the French Revolution would not have happened if there was not already pre-existing institutional arrangements and pre-existing habits inherited from the old regime that were magnified and made worse by both the principles and the events of the French Revolution. One of my favorite statements is by the French Catholic poet and philosopher Charles Péguy, and he was sort of mocking the, the view of the progressive party in France that uh, every from the past was antiquated, should be rejected, and he said, they really believe that all was darkness until January 1st, 1789, and then there was electricity, the beautiful light of the revolution, right? Uh, and remember the French term, the, the enlightenment, you know, in French it's lumière, the lights, right? So it really was this, uh, Kant in one of his writings says that, what is the enlightenment? It's the maturation of the human race. It's when we begin to ask questions. So it was in the air, it was the view, the official philosophy of the French enlightenment, of the, the philosophes, you know, that they were the party of progress. Well, Tocqueville rejects all that. Uh, but he manages to re reject all those ideological and progressivist illusions without romanticizing the French old order and without really thinking that a return to it was either possible or desirable. And I think one way of explaining this is Tocqueville as a political thinker and a political actor belonged to a very small party in France, a party that was not unduly attached to any political form. Tocqueville's primary interest was not in burying or resurrecting the old regime, and it was certainly not in the famous words of Georges Clemenceau, le tigre, the tiger, the famous uh, World War I French leader who said, we must accept the revolution as a block. You know what that meant? The anti-Christianity, the anti-clericism, the terror, that's part of the French Revolution, the kit and caboodle, right? 
Tocqueville rejected that position too. So if you go right to the beginning of the old regime and the revolution, Tocqueville makes a distinction between, this is particularly clear in the author's foreword, he makes a distinction between the generous feelings, the heroism, the aspiration to political liberty that inspired at least some of the actors at the beginning of the revolution. And the degradation of the revolution into full-scale terror and dictatorship, especially in the period 1792 and 1794, followed by Napoleonic militarized despotism uh, in the period between 1799 and 1815. So if Tocqueville is a defender of the French Revolution, it's a golden moment lasting a few weeks and months in the summer of 1789 when some Frenchmen still had the aspiration to create a free country and not a new form of despotism. Uh, by the way, this problem of totalitarian despotism is really, or totalitarian democracy, is really coexisted, co coextensive with uh, modern politics. Um, communism is an even more, was an even more extreme version of, of uh, the kind of ideological despotism that Robespierre and the Jacobins introduced in France in the period between 1792 and 1794. Uh, and communism, contrary to what my students always tell me, oh, it's good in theory, but not so good in practice. The abolition of the family, the abolition of private property, the abolition of the nation, and the abolition of religion are neither possible nor desirable, neither good in theory and certainly abominable in practice. But I, I want to say that the French Revolution is more complicated than Bolshevism or communism because the theoretical or ideological commitment to eviscerate the Christian religion, you know, Marx famously called uh, religion the opiate of the people, you know, politicized murderous atheism was the initial and principal tool of all communist totalitarian regimes. You can't really say that about the French Revolution. Even Robespierre, you know, Robespierre at least was not publicly an atheist. Of course, he supported this silly cult of the supreme being and uh, some version of the Ten Commandments, but tied to French revolutionary ideology and passions. You know, at one point, the Cathedrale de Notre Dame was turned into a, uh, um, uh, you know, some kind of uh, place to, to uh, celebrate Lady Liberty and the religion of reason. But still, there was a hesitancy to sort of get rid of religion altogether. And in this regard, you could say that the French revolutionaries, Robespierre in particular, were probably indebted to Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau was a very um, forceful, even eloquent critic of the political effects and consequences of the Christian religion. But you know, in the, in the, he said it made people see double by what he meant is, are we loyal to the kingdom of heaven or to the church or are we loyal to our country, right? You see double. This was a problem for Hobbes, it was a problem for Rousseau. So Robespierre and the more radical revolutionaries wanted a new religion where you wouldn't see double. It would be like Rousseau's civil religion that was wholly dedicated to the defense and propagation of the revolutionary cause and the French nation. And by the way, we all know, you know, if you don't know, you know tens of thousands of nuns and priests were murdered during the revolution, um, those who refused a fealty or a declaration of loyalty to the new revolutionary constitution and the civil constitution of the clergy were arrested, were tortured, were killed. And even the peasants of the Vendée, it's a French region on the Atlantic coast, they rose up in rebellion in the early 1790s against the revolution in the name of God, king, and country. And if you read their declarations, they say there was so much more freedom under the French kings 
Because for these French Catholic peasants, the freedom to practice their religion and not to become you know, forced coercively into support for this new revolutionary civil religion was very, very important. And by the way, 200 to 300,000 people were killed in the suppression of the Catholic peasant rebellion in the Vendée. 17,000 Frenchmen died juridically executed by the Jacobins during the Reign of Terror um, uh, with that great humanitarian instrument, the guillotine, that was supposed to make executions nice and clean, but it made them, uh, uh, it, it multiplied them, right? right? So uh, the French Revolution certainly had this, these proto-totalitarian elements that would be, I think, perfected by the right and left wing totalitarian regimes of the 20th century. But it also initially had liberal aspirations. And I think that's why um, Tocqueville never condemned the French Revolution simply or categorically the way the Englishman Edmund Burke did in his great work of political philosophy, The Reflections on the Revolution in France. By the way, the, the, the values or the principles of Burke and Tocqueville are very, very close. I mean, that chapter, book three, chapter one of the old regime, where Tocqueville talks about the irresponsibility of the French uh, intellectual class, drugged with ideology, imprisoned by abstractions, ignorant of real, concrete, free political life. That's, uh, that's taken right out of the pages of Burke's Reflections on the Revolution, who says the same thing about the French men of letters. But there's one big difference. Tocqueville says the main or at least initial uh, group or person responsible for this rise of ideolog ideological or literary, what he means by literary politics is like you're writing a script, you're writing a play. You're not looking at things from the perspective of responsible citizens and statesmen. You're writing some beautiful, right, coming up with some beautiful city in the abstract and not looking at the available alternatives, right? And he thought those kind of utopian abstractions were incompatible with not only political realism, but liberty and human dignity. But he said, the first reason for this is that the kings of France did not allow a true space for active citizenship or political liberty. They took away the self-government of many French citizens. They turned pays d'élection uh, into pays d'état, which meant the local provincial liberties of many French provinces, with the exception of one that Tocqueville praises at the end of the book called Languedoc. So it was the only province where an estates general persisted where the church, the aristocracy, and the people cooperated in fiscal policy, in public policy, he said, and he says it was sort of the, the, Fre the French version of England, where a politically responsible aristocracy, a politically responsible and patriotic church, and the bourgeoisie, they were the commoners, and uh, they worked together, and he said they they helped move the ancient forms of the French monarchy into something more like a modern constitutional state. So it's very clear Tocqueville thought that was a real possibility for France, except for the fact that the, the French kings closed that off. You know, when the Estates General doesn't meet for 175 years, there's a problem, right? So while Burke concentrates on the unbelie and rightly concentrates on the unbelievable utopian irresponsibility of the French philosophers and the intellectual class, Tocqueville says, yes, Burke, you're right. But if France had vehicles for people participating actively in free political life, that tendency of the French to take their bearings from utopian intellectuals rather than from people who had some real experience in political life. And Tocqueville at one point says, compare England, where 
you have sensible political commentators like Burke and Hume, who are also, in a way, deeply involved in political life, or at least attentive to political life, with France, where no one had experience of free politics. So there's many similarities with Burke, but Tocqueville is much harder on the old regime because he thinks it had a heady responsibility in undermining political freedom. And uh, without political freedom, there's no school. There's no way in which people learn the arts of political prudence and moral agency. So, uh, and the other difference between Tocqueville and Burke that I think is very important to stress is that as a Frenchman, Tocqueville simply wasn't in a position to reject the French Revolution to core. Absolutely, simply, categorically. It was part of the French political... Remember, it wasn't Bolshevism. Robespierre defended private property. He wasn't an atheist. You know, um, Tocqueville wasn't interested in defending Robespierre, but... You know, it was much easier if you, let's say, you were a Russian like Solzhenitsyn to say, I just condemn Bolshevism. It's a 70-year assault on the best Russian traditions in human nature. Tocqueville really couldn't say that about the French Revolution. So he had to distinguish between at least some legitimate aspirations toward a dignified and honorable liberty in 1789 and all the deformations that follow with the terror and Napoleonic despotism. And I'll read you a quote from the opening of the author's foreword to the Ancien Regime where Tocqueville says, um, there was a brief moment at the beginning of the revolution where love of equality still coexisted with love of liberty. Uh, and elsewhere, let's say in Democracy in America, the beginning of part to volume two of Democracy in America, Tocqueville distinguishes between what's legitimate in equality, the recognition that all men are created equal under God, with what he called the passion for equality, a passion to level, to war on human excellence, to destroy human greatness. So Tocqueville defended equality, but he despised what we might call dogmatic and doctrinaire egalitarianism. And again, that fits in very well with what I would call the liberal conservative position. You do not reject the liberties of modern peoples, but you try to tie them to an understanding of the human soul that recognizes, talks up, and, and tries in its own way to sustain human virtues that existed long before democracy. And this is the, the friendly criticism part that are threatened by the thoroughgoing victory of democracy. You know, a democracy that has little time or taste for the moral virtues or nobility or heroism and that kind of thing, or for the, the self-restraint embodied and encouraged by biblical religion. All right, um, I want to say, how do we make sense of, I'm going to try to wrap up pretty soon, how do we make sense of uh, Tocqueville's, I'm going to use a term from grammar. You know when you're studying French, nobody studies French anymore. It's like the, the language of some forgotten tribe in the Amazon, but it, all cultivated Englishmen and Americans 60 or 70 years ago knew French. You were not educated unless you knew French. That era is long gone. So anyway, how did, how do you, in, 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 when you learn, you conjugate your French verbs, you know, and the passé simple and the passé uh, imparfait and all that. Well, how did Tocqueville conjugate democracy and greatness? This is a very contested question. Was Tocqueville a Democrat? Uh, I think the answer is yes and no. He certainly defended and affirmed the justice of democratic principles within limits. He attacked the ancients 
for taking slavery for granted, and he has a very arresting passage near the beginning of I Am Two, A Democracy in America, where he says, Jesus Christ had to come down to earth to show human beings the true moral equality of human beings, right? He hated chattel slavery. He proposed a bill in front of the French uh, Assemblée Nationale in 1839 to eliminate the last vestiges of slavery in the French Empire. And he wrote an open letter to Americans in an abolitionist journal called the Liberty Bell, where he said, I'm a half Yankee. I love America, but for God's sake, get rid of slavery, because this is incompatible with your calling as a great and free nation. OK, so all of that suggests that Tocqueville was a kind of Democrat. But as this book, The Old Regime and the Revolution, makes abundantly clear, he hated what he called the esprit revolutionnaire, the revolutionary spirit. He hated the idea that the essence, the soul of democracy, was some revolutionary effort to destroy the inheritance of the pre-modern world. And so uh, Tocqueville wanted to separate the ideology and excesses of the French revolutionary spirit from the kinds of practical achievements of political liberty that one saw at work in American democracy and that one saw at work in England, a more aristocratic but free country. And, um, and so um, uh, there's a very common line about Tocqueville uh, which says something like this. He was an aristocrat by heart, you know, in his personal bearing, in his deepest feelings and sentiments, but he was a Democrat by conviction. There's some truth to that, and there's certainly some passages in Tocqueville's writings that suggest as much. So he's a little nostalgic for the old order, but knew it was not a real, living, practical, political possibility. I prefer the interpretation of Pierre Menant in a great essay called Tocqueville, uh, Philosophe Politique, Tocqueville as Political Philosopher. He says, Tocqueville really saw democracy uh, from two different aspects or two different viewpoints. One was the perspective of justice. And you see this, let's say, at the end of book two of the Ancien Regime, where he talks about the indignities that the French peasants, by the way, this was all a residue of a much older order, but the, the corvée and the taxes they had to pay and these silly privileges that the clergy and the aristocrats it didn't really have much to do with how France operated. But it was vexing and annoying and humiliating to the ordinary peasants, to ordinary Frenchmen, in a way that made them throw out or reject aspects of French life that really were essential to um, a France that was faithful to our traditions and yet was committed to political liberty in the best and fullest sense of the term. So from the perspective of justice, Tocqueville makes very clear the modern democratic conception of liberty, liberal liberty of equal rights, is the just one. Every person deserves to be a member of the political community. I'm not talking about people who illegally cross the borders. I'm talking about people who are citizens of the country. But they need to be treated as beings with rights, as rights bearers. And so he says, even though, and if you read the Ancien Regime and the Revolution, he talks about how aristocrats in their prime, in the various intermediate institutions, the one that impressed Tocqueville the most, he talks a lot about it, in book two of the Ancien Regime were the, um, the parlement. The parliaments were not parliaments, they were judicial bodies. It was a very French thing. And uh, the French king had to uh, display the law with the royal council. And then the royal council had to deposit it in the various parliaments. The parliaments of Paris, Bordeaux, etc. cetera. And the, right up until the 1770s, the parliaments had the authority to empocher, 
to block the depositing of the law. They never said the king is full of crap. What they would say in a very dignified aristocratic way was, this law is beneath the dignity of the most Christian king of France. In other words, there were these independent judicial bodies that systematically blocked bad legislation, or sometimes legislation taking away some of the privileges of the aristocracy. But nonetheless, Tocqueville knew that those kinds of aristocratic bodies were powerful checks on the, um, the rise of tyranny and, and a kind of the encroachments of, of centralizing authority under the old regime, under the revolution. And so what are we going to do if you don't have those kinds of intermediate bodies? You don't have uh, a self-respecting aristocratic class. You don't have an established church. You don't have these rich social bodies. You're going to have a lot of atomistic individuals who are disconnected. And that's why when Tocqueville wrote about America, he said, maybe, just maybe, voluntary associations can serve as a substitute for the historical, the rich, substantive role that aristocrats, the church, town governments played in the old regime in blocking the political encroachments of the king. But what I want to add is that Tocqueville thought that the definition of liberty is privilege. Some people had special privileges, others didn't, was incompatible with justice. To that extent, he was a Democrat. On the other, and then he hated racism and slavery. He admired uh, uh, the associative art, as he called it at work in North America. But there was another perspective. And I remind you of a chapter called uh, uh, Book 2, Chapter 10, on the kind of liberty that persisted under the old regime. He point blank denied that the French, the French Ancien Regime was a despotism. Because why, he said, people may have loved the king, they were loyal to its traditions, uh, uh, they would die for the king, but they did not prostrate themselves in a, in a form of obedience to some power whose legitimacy they did not recognize. And so this proud spirit of liberty and resistance to excessive uh, administrative centralization went hand in hand with these inherited habits and sentiments of commitment to, love of the monarchy. But he said there was no humiliating degradation. There was no, the kind of prostration before a tyrant one would see in antiquity or perhaps in modern. I don't know if you've ever seen the, you know, there's a great movie about the death of Stalin and every time Stalin would kind of wake up and look like he was alive, you know, the whole polyp here was spitting on him and kicking on him. And then they were like out of the floor, you know, prostrating themselves before him. And then he'd look dead again and they'd spit on him. Really? I mean, these did, men did not have the, the souls of free men. They, they were men who made it to the very top of a totalitarian system. And the only thing they knew was a slavish obedience and a kind of false rebellion when the tyrant was dead. Well, uh, that wasn't the French old regime. So Tocqueville saw real grandeur in the French old regime. And so he, he thought that even democracy needed to judge the excellences of human life by what he in, invariably or variably called the perspective of grandeur or independence or honor. So sometimes liberty didn't mean equal justice under the law or the equal rights of all. It meant this proud spirit, this honorable self-determination under God and the law. And, um, and so here, as Pierre Menant says, the concern is no longer primarily with relations among men, but with the quality of each man's soul, of his tone, of his stature or grandeur. We just don't think that way. Who's to say what's right and wrong, you know? Who am I to judge? I even have a pope who said that. Popes should be careful when they say things like that. But um, Tocqueville never rejected the perspective of magnanimity. He knew that it was not the same as the perspective of greatness of soul, of justice. He knew that it was sometimes contradiction, in contradiction with it. But he knew that human life and democracy would both be impoverished 
if we just redu reduced ourselves to pleasure-seeking rights bearers. And I think I'm going to end on that note. And, and by the way, just to, you got to understand, and I'm sort of taking this for granted, but it's very, very important. Tocqueville published the first of what he saw as a two-volume work on the old regime and the revolution in 1856. France was now under a new form of despotism. And even Tocqueville was even foreign minister of France for a year under Louis Napoleon, who he, he thought was, you know, he wasn't an evil tyrant, but he was, uh, you know, he was not his, he was not his uncle. And um, he, uh, and he was very upset with French Catholics because he said, they all act in the spirit of Thomas Akempis, you know, imitation of Christ, you know, we want to be holy. Uh, we love our families. But he said, what about being citizens? What about political freedom? You know, he worried that too many people in France, especially on the right, and by the way, during the Revolution of 1848, he actively and aggressively fought the socialists, and in a famous speech against socialism in the National Assembly in 1848, he called socialism a new road to serfdom. Okay, so he's no friend of socialist authoritarianism or totalitarianism, but he thought Christians too often succumb to an anti-political temptation. Uh, be close to your family, worship God, pursue piety, and who cares if France is a free nation? And Tocqueville pleaded with his fellow French Catholics to take their civic self-respect more seriously. And on that note, I'm going to end much as uh, Professor Wazaki had by reading you a quote. And I think this is, he quoted me as saying this is a very beautiful book. It's partly a very beautiful book because it's beautifully written, but it's largely a beautiful book because more than democracy in America, it illustrates and even exudes Tocqueville's nobility of thought and character. So, at the end of book three, chapter three, where he excoriates the French philosophes and the physiocrats, they were the economists of the 18th century, and none of them care about political liberty. They want prosperity, they want efficiency. The, 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 the physiocrats were basically technocratic economists. And he said, many of the philosophes wanted, um, they wanted modern progress without freedom. You know, they're the kinds who would have uh, gone excited. Well, Lincoln Steffens, the American muckraker journalist, went to the Soviet Union in 1925, and he said, I have seen the future, and it works. Jean-Paul Sartre, the famous existentialist philosopher, went to the Soviet Union in 1951, came back and wrote in the French newspaper, Liberation, the freedom of criticism in the Soviet Union is total. You know, in other words, these intellectuals who admired regimes that eviscerated the human spirit, that abolished political liberty. Tocqueville knew this type, and that wasn't Tocqueville. Tocqueville did not want modern progress that abolished the human soul and jettisoned liberty and human dignity. But at the end of this chapter, he says, um, True love of liberty is not reducible to the protection of rights, no matter how valuable they are. It's not reducible to material comfort because if there's a slowdown in the economy or something like that, people might be tempted to sacrifice their liberty and human dignity for the false promise of an authoritarian regime that will make the trains run on time. So he says, what we need in any time or place are a few rare souls, and I think Tocqueville was such a soul, who are imbued with what he called a powerful love of liberty, that uh, a love of liberty that is connected and motivated by its intrinsic charm and not by, not some instrumental concern for the goods it can provide. Um, and what, and he defined it, he said, it's the pleasure of being able to speak, act, and breathe without constraint 
under the sole government of God and the law. I think both parts of that sentence are terribly important. So there's an intrinsic charm and pleasure in being a free and self-respecting citizen and human being. But liberty for Tocqueville, here he's very close to Aristotle or Burke, Tocqueville cannot imagine a humanly choice-worthy understanding of liberty that rejects the ultimate governance of God and the law. Not just the laws of the land, but I would suggest something like the moral law, justice in the fulsome sense of the term. And, uh, and I'll end by saying, to come back to the title of this great and noble book, The Old Regime and the Revolution, I don't think Tocqueville's understanding of liberty is finally reducible to either what, uh, what a contemporary uh, Benjamin Constant wrote a famous essay in 1819 called The Liberty of the Ancients Concerning of the Moderns. The moderns care about liberty, independence, and rights, and the ancients cared about citizens will die for their country. You know, the famous story Rousseau and Plutarch tell the woman uh, has got four sons fighting in a war for Sparta, and a messenger comes and is about to tell her that all four sons have died. And the, the Spartan mother famously says, never mind, did we win? You know, her, she's not like Mrs. Bixby in the Civil War. Her concern is the city. Well, that's not Tocqueville's view of liberty. But nor is it a instrumental view of liberty as something that simply protects our rights or guarantees our prosperity. Tocqueville had a very distinctive and noble conception of lumen liberty under God and the law that activates, you may say, something in the human spirit, some honor, some self-respect that is incompatible with being slavish. You know, 120th century political philosopher called it, going downs with, down with guns blazing and flags flying. You know, in other words, there are times when you fight out of self-respect, out of love of country, and not because of any material benefits that come from the affirmation or exercise of liberty. So there's an awful lot here in the guise, you might say, of a semi-historical study, but I think there's a very rich conception of the human person and liberty that animates all of Tocqueville's writings. And one last comment. Tocqueville wrote three great books. Democracy in America, published in two volumes in 1835 and 1840. The Old Regime and the Revolution, published in 1856. The second volumes published after his death from tuberculosis in 1859, and The Souvenir or Recollections of the Revolution of 1848. A very thrilling book. He's in, the, he's in media arrest. He's in the middle of the act from the Revolution of 1848. The socialist threat, the Bonapartist threat. He's briefly foreign minister of France. He's the head of the Constitutional Commission. He says, all I wanted to talk about is how the Americans did it. No one ever even heard of George Washington. It's a great book. He was so honest about the failings and stupidities of his contemporaries, including his friends, that he asked his heirs not to publish that book for two generations. And it was finally published, and I think it's one of his greatest books, certainly one of the, the big three, and that was published in 1893, and he had already been dead for 34 years. So three great books, so we'll have to do a conference on the recollections in a few years. Thank you very much. I went 10 minutes over, but. Thank you so much, Dr. Mahoney. I think we have about 15 minutes maybe for some questions, if there are some questions for Dr. Mahoney. I'll bring the microphone to you and, yeah, okay. Thank you so much. Um, we really enjoyed your talk and thank you so much for coming here. Um, we have a lot to learn. <laughs> we have so much to learn from Tocqueville, but we as Americans aren't recovering from
such a revolution. We don't have a king that we just got rid of. But if we are to apply Tocqueville, how ought we to go about that? Should we look at economic class distinctions, distinctions of philosophies, or of virtue? Well, I think, I think we can learn a lot from Tocqueville about what a self-respecting, free human being and citizen is. It is not somebody who withdraws from public or social life, satisfied with a small circle of family and friends. That has its virtues and nobility. But Tocqueville called that a pathology. He called it individualism. Tocqueville liked individuality, you know, the, the serious exercise of our human virtue, uh, of human liberty, or the ser service of virtue and civilization. But he did not like individualism if it meant withdrawn from our responsibilities in public life. So I think we can learn a lot about that. I think um, we can also learn that the highest human life is not a high, by the way, what the highest life, human life is, the philosopher, the hero, the saint, as, as the politicians say today, that's above my pay grade. Though I have thoughts on those questions. But we can certainly learn from Tocqueville that a kind of, I, uh, this is a mix of Alexander Solzhenitsyn and Martin Heidegger, excessive engrossment in everyday life. You know, these constant divertissements that Pascal talked about, where we never step back to think about the meaning of life, the proper uses and purposes of our freedom, where we forget we have souls, where we succumb to a kind of theoretical and practical materialism, I think Tocqueville provides a powerful alternative to that debasement of modern self-understanding. My friend, the French political philosopher Pierre Menant, likes to say that um, there are a series of modern thinkers, late modern thinkers, who have rather similar critiques of the degradation of modern man. Nietzsche called it the last man. Rousseau called it the, Rousseau, uh, the bourgeois. You know, always worried what the other guy was thinking, you know. You know the, uh, um, when you're worried too much about what they are thinking about you, you are not a self-respecting and free human being. There's a lot to those critiques, but obviously Rousseau and Nietzsche don't offer much in terms of a positive alternative to bourgeois civilization. But Manon likes to say that Tocqueville tried to correct the defects of modern democracy not with the humanitarian sentimentalism and softness recommended by Rousseau, not with the hardness or cruelty, the blonde beast represented by, uh, recommended by Nietzsche, but by the political liberty exercised by free and responsible human beings who are still informed by an older and living wisdom, including the Christian religion. So you can get everything good in Rousseau and Nietzsche and Tocqueville without the practical calamities that accompany the actualization of their thought. That's the difference between a friendly criticism of democracy and what the late political theorist Gerhard Niemeyer called a total critique of society. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, talk. My question is actually on the subject of individualism and atomism. Um, I mean, the classic criticism of liberal democracies is that they tend towards an atomistic society. And one of the uh, solutions put forth is that religion can help to guard against that. But Tocqueville seems to be criticizing French Catholics of sort of having an atomism of themselves, of drawing within themselves, focusing on God and family, not around them, and of even voluntary associations of ultimately becoming factions within the uh, regime. So for Tocqueville, what can be done to guard against or uh, counter that atomism? Is it nationalism? Yeah. 
and administrative control is the nature of democracy. social bodies that historically united people are weakened. Uh, but Topa said, maybe the nature, but we're, uh, the Americans have admirably developed an art of liberty that allows them, I think that image of Sisyphus is shapeless, uh, helpful here. You never get rid of this tendency, but you can keep it in check. Rule the art of liberty. Yeah. Local liberty is very important. Who cares 